So today, uh, Dr. Piazza and Goldhaber asked me to talk to you about a specific component of tonight's program, which are the new anticoagulants for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. I think you'll agree from Dr. Goldhaber's talk that this is an incredibly pressing time for this issue. We've had warfarin as our only oral anticoagulant available for about half a century. And finally, in the last two plus years, we now have several options, and it's really revolutionized the field, both for certainly atrial fibrillation, but venous thromboembolism as well. Atrial fibrillation is the most common supraventricular rhythm, the most common arrhythmia we encounter in clinical practice. And the reason patients come to our attention is often they don't feel well. They have palpitations, they have shortness of breath. We know it's inextricably linked to heart failure. But the reason why I think we care most about these patients is that they're at tremendous increased risk of stroke. And Dr. Goldhaber mentioned that the risk of stroke in each individual varies, but approximately it's a five-fold increase in stroke with devastating complications with respect to morbidity and mortality for patients and families, but also for the healthcare community at large with really staggering costs estimated to about $16 billion per year. Dr. Goldhaber mentioned stroke is very common, and atrial fibrillation is a common cause of stroke. Approximately one out of every five or six strokes take all strokes together. But in the elderly and patients as they get to their 70s and 80s, it approaches certainly one in four, maybe even one in three strokes in the next several decades. When we talk about how to prophylax against stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation, we're really talking about antithrombotic therapy. If you look at any clot in the body, whether it's in the brain or it's in the heart or the legs, there are two components. There's usually platelets that are stuck together, and there's also fibrin clot, which is the end of the coagulation cascade. So your two options to prevent a thrombus is antiplatelet therapy or an anticoagulant. And we've known for quite some time that warfarin is an extremely effective blood thinner or anticoagulant for atrial fibrillation. If we look at the landmark studies of warfarin versus placebo, there's an approximate 62% reduction, if you combine them all together, in reducing stroke. That's pretty substantial. If you look at a lot of the new drugs or devices that have come along, it's not frequent that you get a 62% reduction in the thing that you're trying to prevent. So warfarin is certainly very effective. And we know that warfarin is better than aspirin. Aspirin is effective, but it's weakly effective. And warfarin, when compared to aspirin in some of the landmark trials, is about 33% or a third better. So clearly, if a patient's at high enough risk for stroke, we really should be using an anticoagulant as our choice of therapy and not antiplatelet therapy. And Dr. Goldhaber mentioned that really aspirin or any antiplatelet therapy is really falling by the wayside with regard to stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. Warfarin's pretty effective. That's why we've been using it for over 50 years, but warfarin's the drug we love to hate. As I mentioned, it is by far the most dangerous drug that we use in clinical practice, and there are several reasons for that as a delayed onset of offset. Those of you who have taken warfarin, you know you have to take it several days, sometimes up to several weeks before you reach a therapeutic effect. And if you stop taking warfarin, it doesn't rapidly disappear uh, from your bloodstream. Your anticoagulant effect can last certainly up to several days, maybe even a week. And we know that we metabolize warfarin differently. I have some patients who are taking 30 milligrams of warfarin a day and other patients who are taking one milligram every other day. So there's, there's tremendous variability in how we metabolize warfarin. There are very well understood genetic polymorphisms in the liver that metabolize warfarin. So everybody ends up on different doses. And because of that, you have to frequently monitor the blood with the INR, International Normalized Ratio, because we don't know if we give a certain dose whether that's going to be too much for one patient or too little for another. But most importantly, I think that recognize the need for new anticoagulants is we're doing a pretty awful job of using warfarin. If you look at atrial fibrillation patients who have no contraindication to anticoagulation, so by the best we can figure, they should be on an anticoagulant. And we look at when they show up to the emergency department with their first stroke, we know that over 90% of patients are either not on warfarin or they're subtherapeutic. Only 10% are in range. So that's a pretty big indictment that we're not using warfarin very effectively at all.
And if you were sitting in a pharmaceutical or a biotech company in the 1980s, and many of these companies in such rooms they were thinking this, and you were going to design a new anticoagulant that you'd want to replace warfarin, what are some of the things that would be ideal to have? Well, you'd love it to be oral. It's certainly easier to take that way. And once daily dosing would be ideal because we know it's much easier to take a drug once a day than it is multiple times per day. Wanted to have rapid onset of action, so you didn't have to wait a week or potentially longer to become therapeutic, but you'd pop the pill in your mouth and you'd be rapidly anticoagulated within several hours. You don't want it to interact with food and drugs. If you Google food and drug interactions with warfarin, you know you'll get a font that's incredibly small. It'll take you about an hour to read through all of them. You'll have a tremendous headache. You'd also like a predictable anticoagulant effect. You don't like every patient on a different dose. It would be nice to know that you can give a dose to the majority of your patients and they would achieve a predictable anticoagulant effect. Extra renal clearance would be important. We know that many patients with atrial fibrillation tend to be older and we know that renal function declines with age. So drugs that are heavily renally cleared, especially a blood thinner, can potentially be dangerous for patients. And to go with the rapid onset of off action, wouldn't it be great if it had a rapid offset of action so that if you needed an elective or an emergent procedure and you stopped taking the medication, that within certainly a day or two you could undergo a procedure safely without the risk of bleeding. And of course, for those emergencies, it would be great to have an antidote. So warfarin, I like to say, is a very promiscuous anticoagulant. Now, the coagulation cascade is extremely complicated, and although I learned it in medical school multiple times and have reviewed it many times over my uh, career in internal medicine cardiology, I frequently forget all of the details. And it's not important, but just to understand that the new anticoagulants really interrupt the coagulation cascade in very specific areas. They're very targeted, and they fall into two distinct areas. Three of the anticoagulants that are developed and have, have results for two of them are rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban. And they inhibit activated factor 10, and that's really the master regulatory step of the coagulation cascade. And then one of the agents, dabigatran, is a direct thrombin inhibitor and interacts at the very bottom of the coagulation cascade right before you convert fibrinogen to fibrin. And if you look at a clot, in the brain or elsewhere, you'll find fibrin clots. So that's the final pathway where you get a clot. And as I showed you before, there are good data for warfarin against doing nothing or placebo in atrial fibrillation. But if you added up all the patients who were in those landmark trials, it's approximately 3,000 patients, a little bit more. If you look at the four landmark trials of the novel anticoagulants, starting in 2009 with the Bigatran, the RELY trial, and then the Rocket AF trial with rivaroxaban, followed by Aristotle Apixaban, and then the ENGAGE trial that I work on, not yet published, there are over 70,000 patients who will be randomized into one of these four gigantic trials. So there is a tremendous amount of data for these new agents. So I'm going to go through and kind of rapid fire some of the highlights of the results, but these are some of the most robust findings that we have certainly in clinical medicine today, and not only will we learn a lot about the new anticoagulants, but we have the opportunity to really push the field of knowledge for atrial fibrillation in general, because there are many things that we still don't understand. Now, it's not that important to know this slide in detail, but these drugs were all developed with certain pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties, and those are really fancy ways of saying how does the drug interact with the body? and how does the body interact with the drug. And some of the important things to keep in mind is that the drugs interact at two different pathways, and I mentioned them to you, factor 10A or factor 2A. But more importantly, they're all rapidly active. So if you take a dose of these medications within one to three hours, you've reached a full anticoagulant effect. So that's pretty remarkable. They do have some minor metabolism with the liver, the cytochrome P450 system, but it's very mild and, and minimal compared to warfarin. It does interact with certain other proteins and transporters in the body, so there are going to be some medications that you'll have to be careful when using these new agents. And interestingly, although their half-lives are all quite similar, somewhere between 
8 to 14 hours, they're actually dosed differently. Some of them are dosed once daily and some of them are dosed twice daily. And that's led to a lot of debate and some confusion among both physicians and healthcare providers, but patients as well. An important feature to notice that every single one of these drugs is cleared somewhat by the kidney. The most so for dabigatran, it's heavily renally cleared, about 80% of the drug. But all of the agents are, metab are cleared somewhat by the kidney, so we do have to be careful in patients who have significant or changing renal function. And so that is a very important feature of these new agents. All of these trials were designed originally for non-inferiority, and that's a fancy statistical term to say about as good as warfarin, because it wasn't thought that anyone could really beat warfarin, because warfarin we know is pretty effective. It's just pretty challenging to use. And the first drug to come up to bat was the dabigatran, the RELY trial, the RELY investigators, and they studied two doses, a lower dose of 110 milligrams twice daily, or a higher dose, 150 milligrams twice daily. And we'll just focus on the 150 milligrams because that's the only dose that was approved in the United States. It not only was as good as warfarin, it was significantly better. So after half a century, we finally had a drug that actually beat warfarin in a head-to-head -head trial. But the data is more interesting. Remember, Dr. Goldhaber mentioned that the reason patients have stroke and atrial fibrillation is an ischemic stroke. They form a clot in their heart, in their left atrial appendage, and that clot gets thrown up into the aorta, and the first organ that it sees, unfortunately, is the head, and patients have a stroke. And these drugs, for dabigatran, it was effective at reducing ischemic stroke, but where the predominant benefits were seen are not actually ischemic stroke, but much more so for hemorrhagic stroke. This was very unexpected. These drugs were designed to prevent clots, but they, at least with dabigatran, seemed to prevent bleeding into the brain, which is really a safety of a drug. We know anticoagulants can cause increased bleeding all over, particularly we worry about the brain. And if you look at the safety, because you just don't want to know if a drug works, but you want to know what are the dangerous side effects of the drug, it had about the same major bleeding as warfarin, and that includes sort of nosebleeds, big bleeds, but the bleeds that you really care about, which are often fatal or devastating for patients, are intracranial hemorrhage, and like the hemorrhagic strokes, which are a subset of intracranial hemorrhage, dramatic reductions of intracranial hemorrhage, about 60 or 70 percent. There was an increase in gastrointestinal bleeding. There's a lot of debate why you see this with the bigotran. It's thought that it's coated in a tartaric acid core, and so maybe patients predisposed to gastrointestinal bleeding. They may have some issues with this drug, but we're still sort of sorting that out. And there was a non-statistical significant increase in myocardial infarction. And now, to be honest, none of these trials really enrolled patients who had atrial fibrillation and coronary disease because they didn't want to confuse the picture. So there were very few patients having heart attacks in any of these trials. So we were very excited, and that was the proof of principle that we could be as good or potentially better than warfarin, and that was the factor 2A inhibitors, the direct thrombin inhibitors. So the first factor 10A inhibitor that came up to bat was the rivaroxaban, the rocket AF trial. And in this trial, it's a little bit more confusing, but when you looked at all patients who were in the trial, and that's kind of the gold standard of doing clinical trials, whether you took a single dose of the drug, if you got enrolled in the trial, they count you, rivaroxaban was as good as warfarin. And if you just counted patients who were actually taking the medication, rivaroxaban was actually better than warfarin. And so a pretty robust result that rivaroxaban is certainly as good as warfarin, and I, there's debate on whether it's better than warfarin like the bigotran was, but still a very positive trial. And when we look at some of the breakdowns, though, we start to see a similar pattern. It had pretty modest reductions in ischemic stroke compared to warfarin, only about an 8%, uh, 6 percent reduction. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not effective in reducing ischemic stroke, because remember, I told you, warfarin reduces ischemic stroke on its own about 64 percent, so it's already doing a pretty good job. So the fact that these drugs are a little bit better, I think, is still excellent, but where do you see really the bang for your buck? Again, it's reducing hemorrhagic stroke, a decrease of about 41 percent. And it had a non-significant decrease in all-cause mortality by about 15 percent. And if you look at the safety side and the bleeding, again, pretty similar 
all cause bleeding to warfarin. But when you talk about fatal bleeding or intracranial hemorrhage, which are really the devastating bleeds that we really care about, cuts it in a third or half. So again, like the direct thrombin inhibitor, dabigatran, the factor 10A inhibitors with rivaroxaban seem to be very effective in reducing ischemic stroke, but remarkably effective in reducing bleeding in the brain, which was not expected when these drugs were developed. The third agent that I'd like to talk to you about, and the last of the ones that have data, are the apixaban study. And apixaban is another factor 10A inhibitor. And they actually did an interesting thing. While their landmark trial against warfarin was going on, they did another trial called Averroes, not comparing themselves against warfarin, but comparing themselves against aspirin in so-called warfarin intolerant patients. Now, to tell you the truth, I don't really know what warfarin intolerant means, because if you actually look people who are labeled warfarin intolerant, it often means that they don't want to take warfarin or their doctor didn't prescribe it, but they were never on it and shown to be intolerant to it. But be that as may, uh, they did the trial, and apixaban beat the pants off of aspirin with respect to reducing stroke. But I don't think that's, the trial was actually stopped early because apixaban was so much better. But I don't think that was really surprising. We've known that for almost two decades. What was really shocking, though, was that apixaban had similar bleeding to aspirin. And that's quite remarkable because we think of aspirin as a pretty safe drug, a baby aspirin, lots of people are on it. And this shows us that an anticoagulant had a very similar safety uh, profile with respect to aspirin. And I think it both shows that the, these new anticoagulants can be very safe, and also aspirin is probably not as safe as we give it credit to. And so we were really anxious when the Aristotle trial was published because this was comparing apixaban to warfarin, which is directly comparable to the other trials I showed you. And similar to the bigotran of the first trial with Rely, apixaban was better than warfarin, statistically better than warfarin, decreased the primary endpoint of stroke and systemic embolism by 21%. But again, we start to see a very similar pattern. All of these trials have a lot of similarities. It reduced stroke a decent amount, 21%, but only reduced ischemic stroke compared to warfarin about 8%. So nothing great compared to warfarin, but still very effective. Where do we see all the benefit, or most of the benefit? In reducing hemorrhagic stroke, cuts hemorrhagic strokes in half. And we have to give the Aristotle investigators credit, as this was the only trial to statistically show that it actually saved lives. Fewer patients died statistically who were randomized to a pixaban than warfarin, an 11% reduction in all-cause mortality. And if we look on the bleeding side, we also have to give the apixaban investigators credit is that this was the only trial to show that apixaban actually had less major bleeding than warfarin. The other trials showed that it had pretty similar all-cause bleeding. But again, when we look at the bleeding you really care about, which is intracranial hemorrhage or gusto severe, which is really life-threatening bleeding, cuts it essentially more than half, almost 60%. So really remarkable results. And then I won't show you any data because we don't have it, but the final of the large mega trials is the Engage AF Timmy 48 trial that I'm one of the investigators for, and we hope to have that data very soon, and it'll sort of be the bookends of the four large major trials in this field. And as a clinical trialist, I'm always asked that there's an enormous amount of data that's been published, and it's very hard for physicians, nurses, and coagulation staff and patients to wrap their head around all of the results and which drug is a specific individual supposed to be prescribed. And so some of the important things that these trials are all huge. They enrolled 14,000 to over 20,000 patients. There were two of the trials that studied two different doses. That was the RELY trial and the ENGAGE trial. And importantly, at least with the 10A inhibitors, they all incorporated in a dose reduction because one dose does not fit all. And most of these drugs are dosed to a lower dose in patients who have renal dysfunction or potentially low body weight. So it is important to factor in dose reductions in patients. It's not one dose fits all. But if I were to ask, you know, how do I make sense of all of these trials, I'd say for the most part, these trials are more similar than they are different. They are very effective in reducing ischemic stroke, but not that much better than warfarin, about 13%. But now, as I've mentioned several times, what they are really profoundly better at warfarin than is reducing bleeding into your brain. Cuts hemorrhagic stroke by half, 
And if you look at intracranial hemorrhage, it cuts it in half. And these were always the feared and devastating complications of anticoagulant therapy. And I think this is why Dr. Goldhaber mentioned the guidelines are really pushing us to anticoagulate more and more people because if the drugs are effective and safer, we probably should be prescribing more of anticoagulation to patients that we deemed low risk previously, which was almost half of the patients we see in clinical practice. And just to note that although the apixaban study showed that these, that was the only trial to show there was a mortality benefit, all of these drugs are actually very similar. They reduced all-cause mortality by about 10 or 15 percent. So these drugs are really incredible advances upon where we stood when warfarin was approved in 1954. And just to leave you with some final thoughts, these drugs are not just for patients who have never been on warfarin before. If you look at the results of the trial, and this is from Rely, these drugs are beneficial in patients who have never seen an anticoagulant before and those who have been on anticoagulation for many years or decades, which is something we didn't know when these trials were started. And another important feature is everyone who's been on warfarin knows that warfarin's only good when the INR is in a certain range, when you're therapeutic at two to three. But it turns out when you look at the data, then the FDA did this where they combined all of the trials and they looked to see, well, maybe these drugs only work in patients who have a hard time maintaining a therapeutic level. And the answer turns out not to be true. These drugs are effective regardless of what your INR is. And maybe some of this is due to the fact that these drugs prevent bleeding in your brain. And that's not totally related to warfarin's INR effect. We know patients with a high INR at increased risk of bleeding, but many intracranial hemorrhages occur in patients with a normal international normalized ratio. And these drugs are very safe to use in cardioversion, which is a very frequent uh, procedure done to get patients back in sinus rhythm, so very effective. But I think most importantly, these drugs appear to be very safe in patients getting urgent or emergent procedures. We know in these trials, and this is from the RELY trial, over a quarter of the patients in the trial actually had to have an elective or an emergent procedure. And although there's no reversal agent, these drugs had a very similar safety to warfarin if you look at bleeding around the procedure. And interestingly, over half of the patients randomized to the bigotran were able to have their procedure within the first 48 hours. And although warfarin has a reversal agent, most of the warfarin patients actually had to wait to three or four days. So these drugs can be used in patients who are having procedure, and some of that is they're so rapidly active that they, the anticoagulant effect is, is severely uh, diminished at 24 hours and almost completely gone at, 24 hour, at 48 hours. And then based on these guidelines, and the Europeans are really ahead of the Americans in this regard, and I think this is why Dr. Goldhaber showed we're really pushing anticoagulation with the CHADS-2 VAS score, because we're really trying to pull out those 40% of patients who weren't receiving anticoagulation in the four. And if you take out, you know, if you look at the data and not put sort of cost in there, I think these drugs offer a significant potential advantage to warfarin. But there are several questions to be answered. How do you compare them? And I think we're going to have to struggle with them in clinical practice before we know whether one drug is better in a certain individual. And although we like the fact that we don't have to monitor it, warfarin is certainly the ultimate personalized medicine. You know exactly how anticoagulated each patient are. And I think we still have to get comfortable using these drugs around procedures. It still makes us nervous. And of course, because they're so fast offset, it's very important that patients are compliant with their medications, because if you miss a day or two of medications, you have zero anticoagulation in your blood. So it's not like warfarin where you miss a dose or two, you're probably protected. And of course, cost effectiveness is huge. No matter how you cut it, these drugs are dramatically more expensive out of pocket to patients. And although you could do fancy cost effectiveness analysis that shows as a society there are less strokes and less nursing home and all of that, when you ask a patient to pay 10 times more out of pocket, that's a substantial thing to consider. So just to conclude, these therapies, I think, provide a, the promise of a more safe and certainly more convenient anticoagulation. There are important differences in the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of these agents that I think will affect how they're used in certain patient populations. And based on what Dr. Goldhaber said, I think there will be a profound shift using these new risk prediction scores that will result in a greater proportion of patients being eligible for anticoagulation. Thank you. Thank you.